Hi everybody, welcome to today's video. We have got actually an awesome kind of mind blowing type of topic. Now, if you see the words at the top of the screen, stochastic generation, don't tune out. For most of you, if you've heard this phrase before, it's a very technical, fancy sounding phrase, but ultimately stochastic generation is at the heart of how LLMs generate output. It's something that we all do every single day. We've just gone through a whole series of exploration around this. And one of the conclusions that we've reached is that we all may be prompting wrong at least when it comes to RAG-based applications where we're looking for fact-based answers. And at the core of it is this whole idea about stochastic generation. So to dive into this, the background for this exploration that we've been doing was a question that came in from a user in our community. It's a very, very simple question. It said, I've been running the same inference using one of your models multiple times, and I keep getting different answers from the model. Why? Now, at first, when we heard this, we went back to this user and our first answer is, well, you do know there is a stochastic element to the way that the models generate output. And anytime you use a fancy sounding word like stochastic, you feel like you're giving a real explanation. But as we dug into this and we started thinking about this, we started saying, well, why is that? And where exactly does this random element, this variability element, come into play and actually with what an LLM is generating. Now, what I'm gonna cover here, again, for those that are deep experts in this stuff, all this sounds like 101. This sounds like the kind of thing that maybe you saw in a college class, you know, in kind of your sophomore year, or something that you read in an online tutorial in like 2020. It's like 101 stuff, but it's stuff that I think a lot of us have forgotten. First, LLMs do not generate strings of output. An LLM in each forward pass of an LLM has been trained on a next token prediction task. It's a causal model. It takes an input and it generates one incremental output in each forward pass of the model. Now to say that it, it produces one single token is actually slightly inaccurate. Actually what the model does is, is it generates an array of output signal strengths, if you will. The dimensions of that array correspond to the size of the vocabulary with the interpretation that we typically have is that this is a probability distribution. It's a probability distribution across the total vocabulary with each element of the array corresponding to a different token in that vocabulary and the overall probability distribution of that particular token as the next token given what was passed in the context of the input. So if you're using a llama model, it's an example, you know, the llama vocabulary is 32,000 tokens, you know, not words, not letters, but 32,000 tokens. And so the output um, from every single turn of the model is this array with this shape of 32,000 by one. And then each of those indices then corresponding to a particular token in the llama vocabulary. All right, so far so good. But one of the things that I think a lot of us forget, we forget because we're not touching it day to day. We forgot it even though we are touching it day to day. We are writing these types of generation scripts. But if you think about what's going on inside an open AI or any of these API based model, well, first there's the model doing its thing, but there's going to be some form of a generation loop that actually is invoking the model multiple times in the context of generating that ultimate output, the, the final response from the LLM. Now, if you look at hugging face code or llama CPP code, if you look at any kind of online you know, generation, it will have some type of loop that looks like this. If you wanna see a good concrete example of it, you can go to the LLMware repository, you can look in the models.py file, look at the inference method then for either the GGUF generative model or the HF generative model. Again, very, very similar kind of generation scripts that you're gonna find you know, all over the place as you start to look for this stuff. The basic flow of this, and let's take a minute to walk through this because there's usually a whole bunch of other complicating things that are here, but the core logic is always gonna look something like this starts with tokenizer has tokenized and converted into a string of numbers, whatever the input is that you're passing into the model. And then the core loop has really three steps to it. The first is this forward pass or the call you know, of the model. What you're passing as input into that model, again, might be a whole variety of other parameters. Typically, you're gonna be passing some pass key values, cache, so the model doesn't have to recompute that every time. There can be an attention mask, all those other sorts of things. There might be other variables about what you want in or out of the model. But at its core, you're gonna be passing in the input tokens. And at its core, the output that's gonna come from the model is this logit, this 32,000 by one you know, vector or tensor that represents then the probability distribution of what that next token is given that input list. That's step one. Step two then, 
you're gonna take that logit, that array, that probability distribution, you're gonna pass it into some type of sampling algorithm. This is where all the top P and top K and temperature and repetition penalties and other filters and grammars and constraints and logit biases and all sorts of things that you may want to add into that probability distribution to ultimately select then one token out of that probability distribution that you received from the model. That's step two. Now step three then is you actually take that next token, you add it to the input tokens list. So actually outside of the model, we're selecting that next token and then adding to that context and then repeating. So we take then the context and let's say it was five tokens. We've now made it six tokens. That six token context then we pass back into the model. We repeat steps one through three until we receive some type of stopping condition. The stopping con condition could be a max number of tokens. It could be kind of an, an end token that we received. It could be any number of other factors that we've said stop if, if the following occurs. But at its core, this loop continues to call the model sample then from the probability distribution represented by the logit, add to that context, and it keeps going until it's done. And then we get the beautiful output that is, this is the generation LLM response that we received. So now the key question comes to, what is stochastic in this process? Where does the random stuff come into this? Well, it largely is not in step one or step three. Now, again, a, a mathematician may quibble with us, and again, they may have a, a deeper insight into this that, that we don't have. But largely speaking, the model, when called in a forward pass, when it's not in a training cycle, all the parameters are fixed, the math functions are fixed, and it is largely a deterministic process. Given the exact same input, the same set of input tokens, generally speaking, it is going to produce the exact same output. Now again, the possible small footnote here that again, a mathematician could perhaps correct us or advise us on, perhaps there are some approximations just given the sheer volume, perhaps there are potential like bit level rounding things with some of these long floats. So perhaps there's a tiny bit of stochastic element as the model is doing a forward pass, but we would say that at least conceptually, that should be an entirely deterministic output is that logit, the probability distribution that's coming out of the model, given a fixed and determinate set of input tokens. Where is the stochastic element coming from? Well, it's coming from this sampling algorithm. It's coming from the algorithm, the set of rules that we are applying to convert that probability distribution that we got as the output from the model into the next token that we're gonna to add to our input tokens and pass back into the model in the next cycle. Now, a really good and interesting question might be, why do we do that? Why do we sample at all? You might say, well, this probability distribution simply take the maximum argument. Take the top, the index of the array element that has the largest value. That is, in effect, what the model is telling us. Take the top sample, so to speak. Why don't we do that always? Well, there are several good reasons for why we would want to sample from that probability distribution, meaning randomly, based on what that probability distribution looks like, select different tokens, not just the top token. One thing might be in a creative generation. So if you are trying to do something, writing something that's longer and more creative, it might be in an image generation setting. It might be in a dialogue where you want some variability so that your bot isn't saying the same thing over and over and over again. Every single time the person comes in, they're not responding in the same way. So some element of varied and creative generation. The second thing is there could be a fairly sophisticated beam search strategy in place. And for those who understand this, it essentially means you're actually keeping multiple potential streams. So you build a stream in effect off the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth, and then you're adding it all up. And then at the end, basically taking the, the aggregate total that has the highest overall probability associated with it. So it's an optimization that isn't based on a single token, but perhaps on multiple tokens to pick the most likely potential output. The third thing then is you may be looking to apply some type of complex set of constraints to it, perhaps a formalism, a grammar. You may be trying to bias in some way this output or constrain the output down specific types of things, a specific type of syntax, perhaps in a programming sense down, you want it to look like, you know, well-formed SQL, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The last reason for this, and I remember kind of the old days, you know, like four or five years ago, one of the reasons you did this was, was models like GPT-2, they weren't really all that great. So a lot of times you'd get this really boring, like low value, repetitive type of output. And so one of the reasons you wanted to crank up this whole sampling was just to get more interesting output out of the underlying model. 
But all of this begs perhaps a very simple question, which is why do we do this in a fact-based rag? We are actually the ones introducing the random element into this generation process. Now, if we're doing this in conjunction with some sort of set of rules or a grammar, then again, there's clear logic for why we would be doing that. But otherwise, we're introducing this random element. If we're doing a greedy token by token process, we're actually the ones injecting a little bit of stochastic randomness into this. Why? Do we have a sound reason to do that? And so the question again then comes in any type of fact-based, you know, rag use case where there's some form of a passage and you want to ask some sort of fact-based question or analysis or extraction or summarization is why are we deviating from the top output value that comes from the model? How often are we doing that? And ultimately, what is the impact from it? So what we're gonna do, we're actually gonna flip over. I'm gonna flip over to my IDE, and we're actually gonna show you a few experiments that we started to run to start to answer this question. 